Good afternoon. I am Janice Lewis George, Council Member for Ward 4 and Chairperson of the Council's new Committee on Facilities and Family Services. Today is Tuesday, April 25th, 2023, and the time is 2.43 p.m. I am calling this committee markup to order. For the record, I'd like to note that we have a quorum consisting of Council Members Brianne Nadeau, Ward 1 Council Member, Matthew Fruman, Ward 3 Council Member, and at-large Council Member Robert White. Thank you to my colleagues for being here today. Today, the committee will consider and vote on its report and recommendations on the fiscal year 2024 budget for agencies under its purview. When we started this budget, we had choices to, to make, but the choices we have ahead of us are nothing compared to the tough choices working families have to make every day. About whether to buy groceries or pay for rent this month, about how to keep their kid cool in a classroom where the cooling doesn't work, about how to stretch a personal needs allowance that hasn't increased in 16 years, about how to make ends meet so that they can care for a child in their care whose parents cannot. Those are the real tough choices. And our obligation as policymakers is to make it so that working families don't have to make these tough choices to meet their basic needs. That's what this budget is about. And that's what our oversight and budget markup have been about. I am proud that together we have found ways in this budget markup to lift up working families, safeguard vulnerable youth, support our neighbors with disabilities, fill major gaps, and invest in critical district infrastructure. I wanna personally thank all of the witnesses who showed up or provided written testimony at our performance oversight hearings and our budget hearings. I also wanna thank the agency directors and their staff and agency fiscal officers for putting in long hours, being engaged and following up with my committee staff and witnesses on so many issues. I wanna thank our council budget office, the office of the chief financial office and all of our executive agency partners for their hard work. I don't know of a single person in this building who saw the initial budget and thought this was gonna be easy. Many programs that we consider indispensable were facing severe cuts. But through the budget hearings, community feedback, hard work, and a lot of dialogue, we were able to work together as a council, OCFO, and executive to get this budget to a stronger place that reflects even more of our priorities as a district. Now I wanna to touch on each agency and the committee's budget recommendations for them. First, we have CFSA. The mission of the Child and Family Services Agency is to ensure the safety, permanence, and well-being of abused and neglected children in the District of Columbia and to strengthen their families. We know what happens in the home is going to be the most critical factor in a child's life. It will imp impact their ability to excel in school, their mental and physical health, their ability to find stable and meaningful employment, and the decisions they make later in life, and so much more. That's why we need an effective and responsive CFSA that ensures every child is protected and has a loving, supportive environment where they can grow and thrive. This committee made some major changes to the fiscal year 24 budget to balance the concerns heard during the performance and budget oversight hearings. First, in addition to adding money back to the Grandparent Caregiver Program, the committee is also proposing and funding the BSA subtitle, the Grandparent and Caregiver Subsidy Eligibility Expansion Act. This will exclude Supplemental Security Income, also known as SSI, benefits from the household income calculations and subsidy considerations for the Grandparent and Close Relative Caregivers Program. During this year's performance and budget, budget oversight hearings, the committee heard testimony from witnesses who urged the council to take action because the current law either makes caregivers ineligible to participate uh, in these programs because their social security benefits are calculated as a part of their household income or because caregivers to receive or cause caregivers to receive a small fraction of the subsidy they need. We can do better and this committee in this budget is doing that. This new subtitle will provide our hero grandparents and close relatives across DC, DC the support they need when they are taking care of their children or grandchildren who parents cannot at that moment. The committee also added 300,000 to support CFSA's home visiting program. The committee heard powerful testimony during the budget, oversight hearing from staff and participants of home visiting programs like Mary Center Fatherhood Child Attachment Home Visiting Program. One witness in particular testified that she had no idea that she was going to struggle more as a home visitor and fight every morning to put her own struggles aside because she is underpaid. 
If we truly want to invest in prevention and keeping families together, then we must do and listen to our advocates and those who are working in our homes. The district expects so much from our community and our providers, but how is the district supporting the people out there doing the work? 300,000 will help retain the dedicated staff at our home visiting programs. Another significant budget item involved Safe Shores. Safe Shores is a child advocacy center for the district and is, the, is part of the multidisciplinary team on child abuse investigations. Safe Shores provides survivor center intervention, hope, and healing for children and families affected by abuse, trauma, and violence in the district. It works to prevent child abuse and neglect through proven practices, policies, and partnerships. This year, the mayor's budget completely zeroed out Safe Shores' budget of $1.3 million. I'm happy to say that the committee restored all $1.3 million to fund the vital work that Safe Shores continues to do and achieve for our youth here in the District of Columbia. The committee is also sending $196,000 plus to the Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety for the Office of the Attorney General to hire a new section chief in the OAG Family Services Division, better known as FSD, to coordinate intensive case review and support for children in homes before court involvement and foster care become necessary. This is advances the OAG and CFSA's shared objectives of assuring the health and safety of all children and promoting family cohesion. The proposed fiscal year 24 budget reduces the child placement budget by 4.3 million. The committee heard testimony during the budget oversight hearing about the potential consequences of these cuts, expecting organizations to deliver to the same level of services for less funding is unreasonable. And it does a disservice to children and families receiving services, as well as to the staff responsible for delivering services. The committee is restoring 515,000 of reoccurring and 495,000 of one-time funding to the child placement budget because of that. I am proud of the work that we have been able to do uh, with CFSA and the work that will continue. Next, we have the Office Ombudsperson for Children, better known as OFC, which is legislatively established as an independent, impartial office responsible to the Council of the District of Columbia and is tasked with improving outcomes involved for children involved with CFSA. In March 2023, OFC's Chief Deputy Patrina Jones-Jess became the Acting Ombudsperson for Children. As Acting Ombudsperson, Ms. Jones-Jess continues to build on the work that was done to establish the office. The committee is adding 224000 so that OFC can hire additional FTEs for a legal analyst and fiscal officers. The committee will also continue to work with OFC on finding an office space on building out its website and complaint form and community engagement. Next up, we have our Department of General Services, also known as DGS. DGS mission is to build, maintain, and sustain the district's real estate portfolio, portfolio including more than 42 million square feet of DC-owned and leased property. Every single day, DGS is working to ensure that families in DC have safe, comfortable, and dignified places to gather, to learn, to exercise, and to play. The committee recommends approval of the mayor's proposed fiscal year 2024 operating budget with modifications. The committee's proposed fiscal year 2024 budget for DGS is $432 million, a 12% increase over the approved fiscal year 2023 budget. Included in this figure is a 5% increase of roughly $7 million increase to DGS's facility operations program that maintains and responds to work order requests in DCPS, DPR, and other public spaces. The committee is proud to sustain this increased investment, including an additional $1 million added by the committee to support DCPS school maintenance. DGS is responsible for keeping our schools and recreation, recreation centers well-maintained and safe. Some of the committee's investments in this area include $13.6 million for ongoing preventative maintenance of HVAC systems in our schools, $6.9 million dedicated to work order reduction efforts citywide, $2.8 million for fire and life safety maintenance like doors and locks, $2.2 million for grounds maintenance, and $980,000 for rodent and pest management services. Further, the committee's budget includes enhancements to support additional hiring in DGS's facility management division. We've seen work orders open for months and sometimes even years. With this budget, we've in, we're investing in additional trades employees to get work done faster and better, and additional managers to keep projects on track and ensure teams get dispatched quickly and effectively. 
We are also recommending several changes to DGS capital budget. Most notably, we are recommending an enhancement to DGS critical systems replacement project to support long overdue small capital projects in our schools and parks, including 400,000 to repair the McFarland Middle School roof, 125,000 to support HVAC improvements at Whittier Elementary, 180,000 to repair or replace the roof at Burroughs Elementary, 200,000 to replace the roof of the field house of the Twin Oaks Garden, home to the district's tool sharing library, and a dozen of other small dollar capital expenses that will improve the educational and recreational experiences of residents. But we know it's not just a matter of putting more money into the agency. That's why we've made several substantive policy recommendations based on feedback and testimony we've heard from the public and my team's investigations into DGS's operations. For example, one issue that crop cropped up over and over again is quality control. Earlier this year, I reintroduced the Work Order Integrity Amendment Act the unanimous support of my council colleagues would require the DGS to get sign off from a school's principal or, other, or their designee before closing out a work order as complete. We've heard countless anecdotes of this being a problem and believe something needs to change. Our contributing factor to this issue that came up through oversight is that DGS and DCPS haven't been updating the email distribution list they use to communicate about work order status in our schools. After a few years, we have a dozens of schools where the right people aren't getting emails about work orders being closed, leading to the sorts of quality control problems my bill aims to fix. So with this budget, the committee is recommending that DGS and DCPS collaborate to fix the email distribution list issue and improve their systems for communicating about work orders in general. Next up, we have DDS. The mission of the Department of Disability Services is to provide innovative, high-quality services that enable people with disabilities to lead meaningful and productive lives as vital members of their families, schools, workplaces, and communities in every DC neighborhood. There are two important highlights for DDS. First, the committee not only maintains the mayor's 744,000 one-time funding for the personal needs allowance, but also recommends as one of the policy recommendations that DDS main, maintains the increase in the future. The current PNA of the $100 was set in 2007 and has not been increased since. The enhancement would increase the personal needs allowance for more than 1,200 people who receive supports from DDS. Second, the committee adds 200,000 in one-time funding to Rehabilitation Services Administration for additional outreach with businesses and district agencies to establish and execute best practices for being a model employer for people with disabilities and addressing racial disparities in employment among people with DC disabilities. Next, we have the mission of the Office of Disability Rights, which is to ensure that every program, service, benefit, and activity operated or funded by the District of Columbia is fully accessible to and usable by qualified people with disabilities with or without reasonable accommodations or modifications. The mayor's fiscal year 24 proposed budget includes 24,900 or a 1.2% increase from fiscal year 23, including a 10,000 increase in federal grants from the State Deve Developmental Disability Council. The proposed budget also adds two additional FDEs, bringing ODR's total to 16. The committee looks forward to working with ODR to ensure all DC agencies are complying with the Americans with Disabilities Act, especially when it comes to providing residents with disabilities sufficient accessible housing options. The committee is also eager to review the numerous compliance reports ODR receives and develops, including those about our parks and polling places. Lastly, we have the, the mayor's office of the deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing, which is mission is to advance the civil rights of the deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing community by ensuring and overseeing district-wide compliance with the laws that affect this community. MOTA's fiscal year 24 proposed budget has an increase of 306,000, which is due to one-time support costs related to an ASL contract that was previously held by the Office of Disability Rights. The committee will continue to work with the agency on proving uh, services specifically for the deaf, blind, and hard of hearing communities and ensuring district agencies are getting proper guidance on best practices and expectations for the deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing communities in the district. I will now discuss the mayor's and committee's Budget Support Act subtitles. First is the mayor's proposed subtitle A of Title II of the Mayor's Proposed Budget Support Act, was jointly referred to this committee as well as Committee on Housing, Business, and Economic Development. 
The land purchased for affordable housing subtitle as proposed by the mayor would have authorized the District of Columbia to purchase privately owned residential land and to leverage that land for the execution of land covenants to guarantee at least 50% of residential units on the land would be affordable to households earning 80% of the median family income or less. The subtitle also would have exempted these transactions from the city's public property surplus and disposition processes. While the creation and preservation of affordable housing must be top priority for the district, the city must be careful to green light policies that inadvertently accelerate displacement, weaken home ownership rights, or subsidize de development deals that do not balance the interests of vulnerable renters. The committee was particularly concerned that the subtitle introduced by the mayor lacked detailed consideration of how current property owners would be compensated for or benefit from participation in land program, purchase program, how the program would interact with existing housing laws, especially with TOPA, which allows tenants to organize and to purchase their buildings, and additional land covenant conditions beyond a singular poorly targeted affordable uh, affordability metric. The committee received no test public testimony on this subtitle and felt that there were too many open-ended questions on land use policy being raised by this subtitle to responsibly revise it within the scope of the Budget Support Act. There is no doubt that the city can do more to demonstrate public leadership on affordable housing and to spur public-private partnerships around deeply affordable multi-bedroom units, but this should be done through permanent, publicly vetted, and transparent legislative processes. There are two permanent bills authored by members of this committee currently pending before the council, the Green New Deal for Social Housing, B25-191, and the Common Ground Act, B25-39, and the third bill announced for introduction this morning, the Priority Public Land Purchase Amendment Act, all introduced by members of this committee. They all propose revisions to how the city leverage its public assets to solve our affordable housing crisis. I will look forward to working with my colleagues to move these three bills forward this fall, but for now, the committee strongly recommends eliminating the proposed land purchase subtitle and pursuing permanent legislation instead. Now we'll discuss the additional subtitles for the committee. School and Park Facilities and Grounds 311 Expansion Amendment Act of 2023. This subtitle follows up on something the council began five years ago, trying to integrate DGS maintenance requests into the district's 301 service request platform. In 2018, the council passed a requirement that DGS connect itself to 311. Unfortunately, five years later, they've only added two service requests, dog park maintenance and pool maintenance. With this budget, we're adding three of the most common and useful requests that we hear from constituents. Uh, broken equipment, grounds maintenance, and overflowing recycling bins. Starting October 1st, we're looking forward to improve integration and responsiveness to maintenance issues in our public parks and spaces. Next, we have the School Security and Transparency Amendment Act of 2023, introduced by Councilmember Robert White. This subtitle requires DGS to conduct an annual proactive security assessment of all DCPS campuses, including interior doors, exterior doors, exterior windows, Public, public address systems, fire alarm systems, and security surveillance systems. The subtitle also makes permanent the omission of work orders related to the security sensitive components listed above. The committee believes it is important to permanently omit work orders related to these issues so there is not a publicly available list of security vulnerabilities in our public schools. Lastly, we have the Grandparent and Caregiver Subsidy Eligibility Expansion Amendment Act of 2023, uh, which I mentioned earlier. The committee also has subject to appropriation repeals and modifications. Uh, this subtitle will repeal the subject to appropriation language in two bills that the committee is proposing to fund or partially fund the fiscal year 2024 through fiscal year 2027 financial plan. This subtitle will repeal the subject to appropriations language in the Educator Background Track Streamlining Amendment, Amendment Act B24989. This subtitle will also repeal the subject to appropriation language in the Greener Government Buildings Amendment Act of 2022, B24-785. For the Educator Background Check Streamlining Amendment Act, the bill was passed subject to appropriations with a fiscal impact of 14,000 for capital upgrades to CFSA's CCWIS capital project. Since the bill's passage, CFSA has identified a manual process they will use to implement the provisions of the bill pertaining to the expungement of eligible records no longer and records no longer require additional capital funds to implement this bill. For Greener Government Buildings Amendment Act of 2022, the law passed last year by the council and signed by the mayor on January 12, 2023, 
accelerates the timeline for requirements that that where feasible, all newly constructed or substantially improved buildings be constructed to net zero building standards. And we're funding an F FTE uh, to implement this law this year. Finally, I will briefly highlight committee transfer outs. As a committee focused on family services, recognize, we recognize the need to think expansively about the needs of vulnerable youth, families, families and residents. Housing, employment, safety, and public services and amenities are all a part of the fabric that strengthen family stability. This committee will be sending $2.1 million to the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, $1.2 million in reoccurring funds to reverse cuts to Project Reconnect, the city's only homelessness prevention program for single adults, $200,000 for a new Family Services Section Chief at the Office of the Attorney General, $400,000 to promote workplace protections for domestic workers, 400,000 to advance the implementation of the Safe Routes to School Act, and 500,000 to establish a new leadership academy at McFarland Middle School to disrupt cycles of violence among district youth. I would like to note that I am moving this report with the understanding that there will be two modest changes to the final report. In the draft report, there is a transfer out to the Committee of the Whole for 550,000 for the startup modernization pro project. After discussing with my colleague from Ward 3, Councilman Fruman, we believe these funds instead be kept within the committee's report as an increase to the critical system replacement project under the Department of General Services in order to fund repairs to the Jackson Reed High School Auditorium. This 550,000 will be used to repair or replace various integral systems to ensure that the auditorium is fully functional. Additionally, the Committee on Public Works and Operations would like to transfer operating dollars in the amount of $6 million over the financial plan to the Committee on Facilities and Family Services in order to fund B24-857, Preserving Our Kids Equity Through Trust Amendment Act of 2022, also known as the Pocket Act. I will now move and open the floor to discussion on the report and recommendations of the Committee on Facilities and Family Services on the fiscal year 2024 budget. Is there any discussion on the report or BSA subtitles? I will recognize Council Member Robert White. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson Lewis George, and to your staff. Uh, I want to note that my Committee Director Sean Hilgendorf, who did incredible work on uh, DGS uh, budget in the past, said on my way up here, they did a really good job on this budget. Uh, so uh, kudos to, to you and your team. As the prior chair of the committee with jurisdiction over the Department of General Services, I can clearly see how much work you put into that particular agency's budget chapter. Your analysis of the issues the agency faces and recommendations for improvement are thoughtful, and I look forward to seeing you continue to work with the agency to achieve its mission for district residents and for DGS's sister agencies. I want to thank you uh, incredibly for sending $3.3 million to my committee for the Emergency Rental Assistance Program and Project Reconnect two vitally important programs that are not funded uh, where residents need them. I know how difficult it is to find such a large sum, and I'm grateful that you prioritize these critical programs that help people avoid eviction and secure housing. I also wanna thank you for funding and including a subtitle in the Budget Support Act for the School Security and Transparency Amendment Act of 2023, which I introduced as part of a series of oversight hearings and legislative interventions when I was chair of the committee with jurisdiction over DGS. My team and I heard, now your team and you here, frequently about a whole host of issues with DC public school facilities and DGS's maintenance work. Some of the most egregious being security concerns, including doors with locks that don't work. You, Chairman Mendelson, and I worked together to identify ways to improve DGS's maintenance of schools, and I hope that this legislation and its inclusion in the budget advance DGS's identification and resolution of maintenance issues and provide a level of transparency and council oversight that will keep us all moving in the same direction and yield a school system that is secure against threats to student and staff safety. Finally, Thank you for including a new FTE to help DGS implement the Greener Government Buildings Amendment Act of 2021, which will ensure the district is on the leading edge of green construction and serves as a model to the private sector in building net zero energy buildings. I also want to note a few other items 
including a new subtitle that will allow district residents to call 311 for issues at DGS managed facilities, including parks and schools. Uh, myself and a lot of other residents are going to be thanking you for that. Uh, $300,000 to increase home visitor salaries. Home visitors are a critical resource for new and expected parents. Providing them with higher pay will help us recruit and retain staff. $1.3 million to restore a cut to safe shores, uh, which the council has had to do every year. And I'm grateful that you're the one helping to figure that out this year. Safe Shores is such a critical part of our safety net for children. It is, in terms of our budget, a relatively small thing, but it is so important and so impactful to the young people who need this program. And finally, I want to note that our committees ultimately came to different conclusions on the land purchases for affordable housing subtitle in the mayor's budget and proposed budget. But our staff work collaboratively and we appreciated your engagement. Uh, so your recommendation strengthen safeguards in our proposal. And I will support your proposed budget, even though we, we disagree on this one policy. So I look forward to voting uh, in favor of this. And again, I want to thank and congratulate you and your team on your first committee budget. Thank you so much. Council member Brianna Doe. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, um, for your leadership and congratulations to you and your staff for the hard work on this well thought out report. Of course, I'm very familiar with how high the stakes are for the budgets in the Family Services Committee, and I'm so pleased um, that you have been such a good steward steward of um, these programs. Every single dollar in this committee goes a long way from housing vouchers and benefits to maintenance of public facilities to inclusive support for residents with disabilities. I commend the work of the committee to continue investing in child welfare and strengthening families. Uh, to name a few highlights that I'm very excited about, $1.3 million to fully fund Safe Shores program, uh, restoring $515,000 recurring and also $495,000 in one-time funding to provide resources to children in care, the allocation of $250,000 to fund the Grandparent and Caregiver Subsidy Eligibility Expansion Amendment Act. Um, and I also want to thank you for holding DGS accountable, which I know is a big priority of yours. 4.5 million for expanding preventative maintenance to all district owned facilities, along with 13.6 million specifically for DCPS facilities. Shifting 1.9 million from the DGS personnel budget to hire more workers to improve the timely closure of work order requests. Any ward council member will tell you this is badly, badly needed. And lastly, requiring DGS to perform annual comprehensive assessment of school security components. We know there are a number of schools in Ward 1 whose security systems are aging and feel that their communities may be at risk because of that. So thank you for your leadership here. I'd also like to thank the committee for including in the agency capital budget funding for Ward 1's Amigos Park. The committee report includes a detailed history of this project and how it's gotten to this point, which includes some complicated funding schemes. And while we'll be able to make significant progress this year on building out the space, this funding will support a phase two that we've determined with DGS and the community is necessary to complete the full assemblage of the site. This is incredibly important, specifically to our Latino community in Ward 1 and 4. The space is meant as a gathering space for so many across uh, the area who've made this corner special already. Finally, I was very glad in late breaking news last night <laughs> to be able to send a transfer of funds to fund the out years of preserving our kids' equity through trusts, our pocket amendment acts, the details of which uh, my staff sent over to the committee and the budget office right before this hearing. Thank you, everybody, for your collaboration. The transfer will be included in the Committee on Public Works and Operations report, um, and I will like to briefly note how significant the legislation is. It makes changes to three areas of the work of the Child and Family Services Agency. First, it ends CFSA's practice of taking the Social Security benefits of children in foster care and using them to pay for the routine costs of care that the agency is already obligated to cover under district law. Second, 
It reforms CFSA's practice in support of youth aging out of care, attempting to identify stable housing. At age 21, half of district foster youth and former foster youth report having experienced homelessness in the past two years. In the district, only one person aging out of foster care has anticipated living in their own apartment after aging out in the past two fiscal years, and district youth aging out of care are just as likely to be homeless immediately upon leaving care as they are living on their own. This legislation addresses that. Finally, the Pocket Act makes the Close Relative Caregiver Program permanent. This program, along with the caregiver, grandparent caregiver program, provides subsidies to low-income relatives taking care of kin, have historically been 100% effective at preventing entry into foster care. I look forward to transmitting these funds and also working with Chairman Mendelson in the Committee of the Whole to find the funds for FY24. Thank you for all your hard work, Madam Chair. I, I'm looking forward to voting in favor of the committee's budget recommendations. Thank you. Councilmember Fruman. Thank you to Chairperson Lewis George and the Committee on Facilities and Family Services for your diligent work throughout the performance oversight and budget oversight processes. Despite the restraints of a difficult economic atmosphere, the committee produced a high impact people first report under the chairperson's leadership. And I have to say did so in an extraordinarily collaborative way with the members of the committee to which I'm, for which I'm very grateful. Uh, coming into this budget process, I sought to expand opportunity for all residents and to support a fair recovery. In my fiscal year 2024 budget priorities, I identified critical funding deficiencies for facility maintenance, school safety, support for vulnerable children, and people with disabilities. This, the committee decisively supported these priorities and produced a future-focused draft budget report I am confident will make Ward 3 and the whole city more inclusive and equitable. To ensure responsive maintenance of our public facilities, the committee increased the facility operations budget, including an additional 4.5 million for preventive maintenance across DCPS facilities. These dollars coupled with funds for work order reductions will ensure our DC public schools are safe, well-maintained environments where students can learn. I'm grateful that the committee funded my request to add $550,000 for the repair and replacement of audio, visual, lighting, and other systems to ensure a functional Jackson Reed High School Auditorium. These funds, alongside the current contract for roof repairs at the school, will rectify the impact of past leaks and support more robust arts programs for students at our, from across the district. I was heartened that the mayor included a property acquisition fund in her initial proposal, as it indicated the executive's embrace of the, con of the concept, which could support housing equity and advance the district's housing goals more nimbly. I concur with the chairperson's concerns, however, about the lack of specificity in the proposal and support Chairperson Lewis George's, George and her call to establish this fund through permanent legislation. And I look forward to careful review of the proposals that are on the table from my colleagues and have and or been recently introduced. Uh, the committee effectively collaborated with colleagues across the committees to identify funding for shared priorities, like improving public facility maintenance and supporting neighbors with disabilities and vulnerable children. It, I, it, it also identified excess funds to recover a small portion of the emergency rental assistance program, um, a, a priority that really needs uh, support from other committees as well. This collaborative approach will aid residents facing eviction and bring, bring, uh, begin to build back crucial homelessness prevention uh, supports in response to looming rent stabilized unit rent increases and rising cost of living. I'm confident that the report's recommendations expand our facility maintenance and child welfare and disability support beyond what is contained in the initial proposal, proposal and I will enthusiastically vote for the report in this markup. Thank you. Thank you so much. Council member Zachary Parker. Thank you, Chairperson Lewis George. And congratulations on putting together uh, a very thoughtful uh, plan and, and ushering us through this markup process. Also, I want to acknowledge Committee Director Perkins uh, for your hard work. 
uh, as well as all of the committee staff working so hard uh, on this report. I'm excited uh, that the committee is advancing specific adjustments to the mayor's proposed budget that will result in material changes in DC residents' lives. Uh, the committee proposes uh, certain uh, enhancements that I will reference. Uh, as has already been mentioned, the $2.1 million for the emergency rental assistance program that will literally make the difference of some residents being able to stay in their homes, uh, as well as the $1.2 million uh, for Project Connect. Uh, there is a restoration of the $1.3 million, as has been mentioned, for the Safe Shores program, which makes the criminal legal system less dramatic to navigate for victims and their families. Uh, there is a reallocation of $71,000 to the grandparent and caregiver program. Uh, there are some $6.9 million for dedicated work order reduction efforts through DGS. Um, and given the findings of the audit report for DGS, uh, this is a welcome enhancement. And my hope is that it will lead to improved uh, efficacy at the agency. Uh, I also want to note the recommendation to expand DGS's preventative maintenance program um, and am hardened that uh, we have heard certain those same calls uh, from the agency itself. Um, this markup specifically allocates uh, critical system replacement funds to a number of War 5 schools, uh, for which I am grateful. Uh, those schools include Burroughs, Lang Langdon, and Noyes Elementary Schools, um, and it repairs uh, the roof of McKinley Tech. I also applaud the policy recommendations for DGS in particular, including to strategically hire more staff uh, and the push to develop a strategic hiring plan uh, for a call to be more clear about prioritizing work orders and specifying whether they are from DPR and DCPS um, and adequately documenting procurement actions um, so that it includes contract provisions and other information so that we as a council and DGS can hold contractors accountable. My hope is that with new leadership at DGS and these thoughtful investments, uh, we will see change. Uh, there are a few areas uh, that I will flag as uh, areas of question, I will say. Um, I note several sweeps of FTEs at CFSA, um, and I wonder whether or not these sweeps will impact the agency's ability to execute its mission. Um, there's also no enhancements of note uh, for the Marion Berry uh, building uh, from what the mayor has proposed, and I know that that is the house of the old council chambers where the State Board of Education holds its meetings, um, and they have repeatedly called uh, for the ability to host hybrid meetings, um, and we heard compelling testimony uh, for uh, preventative maintenance for our Eastern Market and Ward 6, um, and we don't see enhancements there. My hope is that between now and our vote as a full council, these matters can be addressed. Uh, but overall, I think this budget uh, and markup includes very thoughtful en enhancements that, as I said, will lead to me a meaningful material changes for district residents. Uh, there are a number of school facilities that will uh, see drastic improvements, uh, both in Ward 5 and throughout the city. Um, and my hope is that with these investments, uh, we'll see a rapid change at DGS as an agency. Uh, so with that, again, congratulations, Chairperson Lewis George, and thank you for all your hard work on this. Thank you so much. Uh, at this time, I move the report and recommendations of the Committee on Facilities and Family Services on the fiscal year 2024 budget for agencies under its purview with leave for staff to make technical and conforming changes. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please indicate by saying no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion passes. Thank you. Before I adjourn, I would like to thank the staff on the various committees that work with us on transferring funds, drafting budget support act subtitles, working on the capital budget and all of the things that go into this process. A huge thank you to the entire budget office team, especially Kyra. Thank you so much, Kyra. And Joe, Jen and Andy and to the office of general counsel, especially David. Uh, and thank you to Jamie, our analyst at the Office of Chief uh, Financial Officer. 
I would like to thank my committee and legislative staff for their hard work. Uh, we just received committee assignments in December, so there was a lot of work and preparation to get us to this point in just four short months. I'm incredibly proud uh, of my committee um, director, Will Perkins, my deputy committee director, Nikita Easley. You all are amazing. And thank you to my whole policy team, Will Singer, Joanna Blotner, and Sebastian Wyman. I also want to thank all of my staff, staff members, Kelly, Sharniza, Jim, Barbara, Alex, and Escadar for all of their hard work, especially with War for Concerns and Investments. We are truly a team over here, and I appreciate all of you deeply. Uh, thank you to my committee members and colleagues. Uh, um, I have a mix of some of what Councilmember Nadeau had before and what some of uh, Robert had before, and I stand um, in your legacy and in your leadership of care and oversight and concern, um, and I've been honored to do so. Thank you all for your collaboration in helping uh, me and my staff with this transition to being committee chair and to your staff for being so collaborative. Uh, and working with our staff in the ways that we do. I think it is a testament. Our collaboration is a testament to that working together, we get a good result. Um, thank you to uh, Council Member uh, Zach Parker um, and Matthew Fruman. It is amazing to have you on this committee. I think we have, this is my favorite committee and not just because it's mine, but because it has uh, my favorite council members and colleagues on it. Um, I can say it's true. Um, <laughs> Um, I don't remember a budget like this, but I also know that we could not have accomplished a lot of what we were able to do without the commitment from all of you, um, from my staff to the budget office, to the Office of General Counsel and D.C. residents. Um, but we are not done. So we look forward to working with the chairman and the committee of the whole to ensure the final fiscal year 2024 budget is a budget that meets the true needs of our city. So with that, with that, the business before this committee have concluded. Uh, the Committee on Facilities for Family Services, which my team likes to call Team FFS. Uh, at the time is 3.24 p.m. And this additional meeting uh, of the Committee on Facilities and Family Services is adjourned. <laughs> okay.